Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ilko Kessels. I'm the executive director of the Global Center on Cooperative Security. And on behalf of all of our partners in the room here today, welcome uh, this morning to uh, the side event on inclusive civil society engagement uh, to support rights-based counterterrorism efforts at the United Nations uh, Vision Forward. Uh, we're going to open with a couple of introductory remarks uh, by uh, some of the co-hosts uh, before uh, we'll turn it uh, to the panel for a panel discussion and then hopefully uh, an interactive uh, Q&A uh, towards the end of the meeting. Um, we're also uh, virtual, uh, so many others are joining us online uh, as we are here in the room today uh, from all across uh, the world. But first, it's my pleasure uh, to turn over the floor to Ambassador Martin Bille Hermann, the permanent representative of Denmark to the United Nations. There it is. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to, to all excellencies, things, distinguished representatives, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, first of all. Thank you for getting up uh, early, uh, early in the morning. And then secondly, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this side event of the UN Counterterrorism Week, which of course brings together a myriad of stakeholders seeking to prevent and counter terrorism and violent extremism. I also want to extend a warm welcome uh, to my good friend, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, Ms. Ilse brands Keres, as well as, of course, to our distinguished panel at today's discussion. Today's uh, event and the topic for our event today is very much at the heart of the Danish priorities related to all the thematic discussions held during uh, the UN Counterterrorism Week. And let me start by saying that we support, we firmly support all efforts to ensure that civil society is and remains mobilized as part of what you might call a whole of society approach to addressing terrorism and violent extremism. As you all know better than most, civil society and frontline workers hold unique insights, expertise, and access to local communities, all of which are, of course, essential to strengthen social cohesion and build resili resilience. Now, these insights, these perspectives, are also vital in securing effective and sustainable efforts related to rehabilitation and reintegration. Moreover, Denmark's own experience showed that locally anchored solutions to conflict are often the most effective and lasting ones. And to achieve those, we need, quite simply, civil society on board across all areas of our uh, efforts. This includes empowering youth, women, religious, cultural, and educational leaders, and all other concerned groups of civil society. Colleagues, in Denmark, the prevention of Radicalization and violent extremism often starts in schools, in sports clubs, and at after-school activities. Quite simply, in the civic space where people live their lives. And local partners and civil society actors play a key role in this preventive work, in empowering children and young people to engage meaningfully in society. Now, from a multilateral perspective, we therefore fully support initiatives to advance the meaningful engagement of civil society. And furthermore, protecting the participation of civil society and human rights defenders is and remains essential, in our view, to safeguarding human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism. Now, given Denmark's role as a co-leader of the Unmute initiative in partnership with Costa Rica, and I have my good colleague sitting right over here, um, I can't stress enough the value of all the useful contributions from civil society to the work of the UN. The UN and its counter-terrorism architecture are no different. It needs also civil society to remain in touch with local developments and needs. The diverse perspectives, expertise, and lived experiences, if you like, of civil society all bring indispensable local insights, which should be made use of in an even more structured and systematic manner. Ensuring that the voices of all stakeholders are heard strengthens the basis for policy making. This is a fact. Colleagues, this week we will conclude the eighth review of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy. And here, civil society organizations like the Global Center and others have been sharing their valuable insights and recommendations for bringing the agenda forward. Not least through the biannual publication of the Blue Sky Report, which was successfully launched at the beginning of this month. Now, this is just one of the many ways we as member states and the UN as a whole benefit from an engaged and mobilized civil society. As the Secretary General said in his report, our common agenda, we need to move beyond consultation and include civil society directly in the work of the UN across all pillars. So how does this actually look in the context of countering and preventing terrorism and violent extremism? 
That's what we hope today's event can inspire, a frank discussion uh, about where are the obstacles, where are the opportunities. And with these opening remarks, I will, with the permission of the moderator, hand over the floor to my colleague from Costa Rica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good morning to you all. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, friends, I'm honored to welcome you to this event on inclusive civil society engagement in support of rights-based counterterrorism efforts. As we gather here today on the margins of Counterterrorism Week, we aim to discuss opportunities, challenges, and practical recommendations. In the fight against terrorism, it's crucial, crucial that we prioritize meaningful, diverse, and safe engagement between civil society, government, governments, and multilateral bodies. We can ensure the protection of human rights and we can ensure the protection of human rights and give voice to the communities most affected by terrorism and countermeasures if we actively involve civil society in policy design, development, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Costa Rica strongly believes that it's imperative that the UN counterterrorism actors strengthen their policies and procedures by engaging civil society. This entails involving stakeholders in program development and implementation, inviting them to key meetings such as the UN Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact and facilitating regular interaction with resident coordinators. Today we'll explore how civil society, including women-led organizations, have engaged with the UN counterterrorism architecture, discuss the challenges civil society faces in their engagement efforts, and draw some lessons learned from initiatives such as the Unmute campaign, which Costa Rica is very proud to have led or continues to lead with Denmark. This campaign has demonstrated the power of amplifying voices and engaging communities. It is through collaborative efforts and partnerships that we can create sustainable change. Together, we can envision a future where counterterrorism efforts are firmly grounded in the principles of respect, justice, and equality. We can also pave the way for meaningful gender responsive policies, programs, and actions by bridging gaps, breaking barriers, and nurturing an enabled environment. By prioritizing gender mainstreaming, we can promote women's participation in decision-making processes, develop target initiatives, and address the specific needs and vulnerabilities of women and girls affected by terrorism. By listening to and empowering women, we can reshape narratives, dismantle gender stereotypes, and foster inclusive societies to reject extremism. And one day, and I truly hope that one day, we hope that we can have a serious discussion about the role that masculinities play. I encourage you all to actively contribute to this dialogue, sharing experiences, best practices, and innovative approaches. Let us seize this opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to gender equality, women's empowerment, um, the roles of men and, and boys, and the full realization of our rights. Thank you for your presence, dedication, and engagement, and I wish you all inspiring discussions and fruitful outcomes during this important event. I thank you. Thank you to the ambassadors of Denmark and Costa Rica, our co-hosts uh, in this event uh, for your um, important opening remarks and, and framing of our uh, desired outcomes of this session, but also, of course, of our broader uh, work uh, to uh, better and more structurally and more inclusively engage uh, civil society in, in uh, UN counterterrorism efforts. And thirdly, I will uh, turn the floor over to uh, the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, uh, Ilse Brandt Keres, uh, for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, delegates, dear colleagues and friends. Good morning, first of all. I join Martin in, in, in congratulating everyone that found it worthwhile to get up just a little bit earlier this morning to be here. It shows the importance of what we're doing. And I would like to thank, of course, the governments of Costa Rica, Denmark, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and Global Center on Cooperative uh, Security for co-organizing this, this uh, important discussion with our uh, office. So we are here to discuss a critical aspect of our joint efforts um, and, and really continue to um, 
and the continuous objective, really, of making sure that we know what it means to have meaningful, inclusive, and safe engagement with civil society in the United Nations uh, Global Counterterrorism Coordination uh, Compact. We often talk about this, we say it all the time, it's like a mantra, but then what does it really mean in practice? So we agree, all of us, I think here, that this aspiration is not just a human rights and a moral imperative, but really it is a strategic necessity, and I think the initial remarks really spoke to that aspect already. Civil society is an indispensable partner. This is something our, our dear special rapporteur stressed yesterday too. It's not just a matter of including from time to time, but really having a real partnership in the quest to uphold and promote human rights in counterterrorism. Um, and when we build genuine partnerships with civil society organizations, uh, we know that we can harness and leverage um, the respective expertise, uh, uh, the networks, the roles, and, and also the influence that we have as within our different um, capacities. So an inclusive, meaningful civil society engagement is really uh, requires a few minimum conditions. Um, I wanted just to mention a couple of things. First, participation and representation of marginalized and vulnerable groups in the decision-making processes, very importantly. Second, early and sustained engagement continuously. And third, support to ensure the safety, the security, and the protection of civil society actors working in the field of counterterrorism. Uh, including from negative effects of counterterrorism measures, but there are also other aspects in there, including strengthening responses to prevent and address intimidation and reprisals against those seeking to cooperate or cooperating with the United Nations uh, as well, in which um, I have been also given a specific role by the Secretary General in addressing this point. So I think that exchange is also very important uh, that, that we keep having. Just a couple of maybe small scale, but I think important um, proposals potentially for action so that we can move ahead in that more practical sense. Uh, and I hope that that triggers really or contributes here with the discussion that, that we will be having um, on how to really improve and make sure that the engagement is truly meaningful uh, with civil society in the UN counterterrorism system. So first, um, regarding safe engagement with civil society organizations, I would propose to think about concrete preventive and protective measures. So on prevention, establishing dedicated focal points for civil society engagement and establishing safe channels to share information and alleged incidents of reprisals. Those could be good starting points there. On the protection side, specific budget lines for urgent protection support and quick referral paths um, with threatened partners are really small investments that can have significant and practical impact. And second, supporting civil society organizations requires providing the necessary resources. We all know that. Um, we all say it, but let's really take that on board. Capacity building opportunities and unhindered access to information that enables civil society to continue effectively and meaningfully to, to contribute to our common counterterrorism efforts. And finally, greater transparency, I think, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, civil society is, is clearly uh, important as well. One good practice uh, that, that, uh, that could serve as a model for greater and more open and transparent levels of engagement uh, is something our office can, is, can offer, OHCHR's BTEC project, as we call it. There are recommendations of closing the feedback loop. And that really means instilling the practice of informing stakeholders what actions and deci or decisions have been taken based on their contributions um, and, and of civil society actors, that is. And also, if actions are not taken, why they have not been taken, um, and making sure that that continued exchange is there. So in closing, I'm really confident that these discussions, this important event and having discussions here will bring uh, the ideas to the table that you, that you all have so that we really genuinely contribute to 
establishing what does it mean to have that meaningful engagement that we all keep talking about, and let's take those practical steps forwards towards it. So I'm happy here to sadly not be able to listen the full time as we are leaving slightly early, but certainly our colleagues are here and we will continue our engagement with all, all of you who are here and of course also online. Thank you very much. Thank you, ASG Brunskers, uh, for uh, those framing remarks and the, the call to move from this mantra that we hear increasingly, which is already progress uh, from, from many years ago, now to really seeing this and implementing this as a strategic uh, necessity and for some of the very concrete suggestions and important work that uh, OHCR is, is doing in this, uh, in, in this space. And thank you to all uh, the co-hosts, uh, our partners, uh, for getting us together in, in the room uh, today. Um, those of you familiar with the work of the Global Center know that inclusive and diverse civil society engagement in counterterrorism efforts really sits at the core uh, of our organization's mission uh, to advance inclusive human rights-based policies, practices, and partnerships uh, that address the root causes of violent extremism. And it's precisely these kinds of partnerships that deliver more sustainable and more impactful solutions uh, that address the threat of, of terrorism. Uh, looking around the physical room here, but also, of course, the virtual room. Uh, it's great uh, to have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues and partners uh, join this discussion. We need to continue to enlarge that circle uh, and make sure that we are talking uh, not just to those uh, already convinced uh, of um, uh, this mantra and its strategic necessity, but also bring in those uh, that are uh, yet, yet to be convinced uh, to make sure that we're having a real impact. Um, thank you. Um, and it's important really to have these different perspectives, these different contacts, um, uh, and the different means to get to this ultimate goal uh, shared uh, by those, those folks. The reality of course is, and many of you are aware of this, that only 3.2% of the world's population currently lives uh, in countries with open civic space. And that's a trend that uh, has worsened over the years and is likely to continue to worsen and uh, getting us, us ever closer uh, to that, that zero point. Uh, and unfortunately, the misuse and the abuse of counterterrorism, uh, PCVE, uh, and CFT measures have become increasingly widespread. Uh, community programs are being securitized and reprisals for engaging on security issues and with international partners uh, are increasingly more common. As I indicated during my remarks uh, at the uh, panel at the conference uh, yesterday, we need an enabling environment for, for civil society. And to date, civil society engagement in UN counterterrorism efforts and with UN counterterrorism bodies has been ad hoc, it's been opaque, it's been largely homogenous, and it's been reliant on the priorities and interests of individual member states and global counterterrorism compact entities. Now, with funding from the Netherlands, uh, Germany, and the United Kingdom, the Global Center is partnering with Rights and Security International on a scoping project to facilitate civil society exchanges and discussions on the need and potential avenues for, the viability of, and the interest in an independent engagement with relevant UN bodies and mechanisms on counterterrorism issues, including, of course, the Global Compact. Around ANGA 2023 uh, this year, uh, which is scarily close, uh, we intend to release a report that explores opportunities for the regularization and diversification of civil society engagement with the UN counterterrorism architecture, including an overview of prerequisite conditions, recommendations for specific methodologies and platforms, and a funding and sustainability strategy. Now we're in the middle of the consultation process and it's already quite clear that there's, there's no one way to do this. Civil society is tremendously diverse. They have tremendously different experience working on this topic um, uh, with, uh, uh, with governments in different parts of, of the world. And we need to find ways in which to facilitate um, uh, all of those perspectives in these, in these kinds, of, uh, kinds of discussions. Um, we've brought civil society actors together in several regions of the world. Uh, and then also yesterday we launched, as part of this project, a digital survey to reach those that we weren't able to connect with uh, in person. And my colleague Adele will post its survey online on the Zoom chat function, uh, and we'll also share it with everybody in the room here today. And we welcome you to circulate this widely uh, so that we're able uh, to really capture uh, the insights uh, of, those, um, of those individuals um, that are uh, not just uh, part and parcel of efforts to prevent uh, radicalization recruitment in their communities, but also uh, are at uh, the wrong end of government responses uh, in, this, in this space. I welcome you to get in touch and to learn more about this important project. Uh, you will have received a background note across, uh, which is shared across the room, uh, as well as in, uh, on Zoom, uh, and invite you to talk uh, to my colleague Francisca, today's moderator, uh, who's leading this, uh, this initiative. 
Now, as the title of uh, today's event suggests, uh, we really aim to develop a common vision of more structured and inclusive civil society engagement with the UN on counterterrorism issues, and indeed understand what are some of the obstacles, what are some of the opportunities, and also importantly, what, what can we learn from adjacent fields and similar initiatives in the United Nations, including from the Unmute campaign, uh, from uh, the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security, and of course the important work that the Special Rapporteur is undertaking, including tomorrow's release uh, of her global study. Um, and so our fantastic panelists here today, as well as uh, those um, um, uh, here in the room, um, are going to share some insights and experiences uh, working on these initiatives and helping us to uh, understand how we can learn from this uh, in uh, the counterterrorism space. So I look forward to a very engaging discussion. Thank you again for joining us today at a very early morning uh, for those in the room here. Uh, perhaps a somewhat more reasonable time for those uh, joining online. Um, and it's now my pleasure to hand over the floor uh, to uh, my colleague Francisca Paxo Tabucci, uh, Global Centers Director uh, of Multilateral Relations, to introduce and moderate the panel. Francisca. Good morning, everyone, from me as well, and good afternoon and evening for everyone who's joining us uh, virtually. Um, thank you, Ilko. Before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to share a few uh, housekeeping uh, rules with you. Um, today's event is a hybrid event. Uh, we are joined by over 150 colleagues from around the world, in person and online. Um, some of them we will hear from during the Q&A part of today's um, uh, meeting um, for a quick intervention. The event is also live streamed on UN Web TV and we encourage you to share the recording of the event um, widely with anyone you think might be interested in the topic. Um, today's meeting has French and uh, Arabic interpretation. A big thank you to the four interpreters that joined us so early today. Um, and we have received quite a few intervention requests. Uh, almost everyone who's joining us today uh, had a contribution, which is wonderful to see. But uh, I apologize in advance. Unfortunately, we won't make it to most of you realistically. However, as Ilko said, we have distributed a background note on the scoping study that we're undertaking, and you will find my email address on that background note. So I would welcome to hear from all of you um, if you want to submit your intervention or any points um, that you would like to share with the project team with RSI and Global Center uh, via email. So please get in touch. Um, I think that is it for the housekeeping uh, rule. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today's panel. On my right, we have uh, Mavi Cabrera Baleza, who's the founder and chief executive officer of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Her leadership in collaboration with civil society, governments, the UN, and regional organizations in peace building and conflict prevention resulted in the establishment of two important global mechanisms, the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund and the Generation Equality Compact on Women, Peace, and Security and Humanitarian Action. She was a founding board member of the fund and is the current co-chair of the board of the compact representing the global network of women peace builders and the Bishing Plus 25 Civil Society Coalition on Women, Peace and Security and Youth, Peace and Security. It's a pleasure having you. On my left, we have Maji Petrix. Um, is the Preventing and Transforming Violent Extremism Lead Facilitator and Coordinator with Carefronting Nigeria. Mm -hmm. He has been working for over 20 years in the development sector with 12 years progressive experience in preventing violent extremism programming in the Northeast region of Nigeria, where he seeks to integrate trauma resilience and restorative justice approaches in violent extremism prevention interventions. Mm -hmm. He works on trauma consciousness, resilience, counseling, and forgiveness, and has also developed specific interventions for children who have experienced violence and other atrocities. Thank you for being here. And uh, finally, um, Khalid Ibrahim, who is the executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights in charge of management, program development, fundraising, and training. He's a human rights defender with decades of experience in the human rights field with a specific interest in the use of new technologies to enhance the protection of human rights in the MENA region. Thank you for being here, Khalid. Um, 
So with that, I would turn to, to you first, Khalid, with the question that as executive director of the Goal Center for Human Rights, you work closely with human rights defenders. Can you speak about the challenges you and many of our, your partners are facing when engaging with national governments? Thank you, Khalid. Uh, thank you, Francisca. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for making time to attend this uh, event. A special thanks uh, to the UNSP, Finola Nolin, uh, for all her efforts and for making time to join us here. Uh, if we talk about the challenges that are facing us uh, with uh, our engagement uh, that are really almost uh, could be described as really uh, bad experience when we are talking about uh, national governments in the MENA region, a region that marked with dictatorships for so long. The, uh, the oppressive nature of our governments uh, uh, is clear for any uh, observer, national or international. Now, the first challenge is the mentality. Those who are in power, they look at the vendors as enemies to the state, not as partners to build a prosperous future for every single citizen. And that is really something very difficult will make our work uh, almost uh, so risky. A lot of people, they are in prison. Uh, as we speak now, more are going to be in a prison just because of this mentality. We are independent human rights defenders. We don't have any political party. We don't have any uh, hidden agenda. We just want uh, government to respect people's rights. But even with that, we are not safe from uh, the risk that is you know, uh, very clear and visible across the MENA region. Now, the other problem is uh, the use of legislations. Governments across the MENA region are using legislation to imprison defenders, such as cyber crimes law, a terrorism law, we have a lot of prominent defenders that are in prison, as we speak now, accused of terrorism. Me, I could be a terrorist in the view of Saudi Arabia. You may be also, just because we are promoting human rights in our region. Uh, then uh, our governments are using the counterterrorism uh, legislative uh, procedures and uh, policies in addition to national security as a pretext to imprison our colleagues. That is, there are many examples uh, about that. The time is limited. I, I won't be able to go through that. And then there's another challenge. Governments in our region, almost they, they own the traditional media. On occasion, the intelligence, they are running some newspapers and TV stations. Then people, including activists, they went to social media uh, networks to express their views about public uh, affairs. And governments in our region created cyber crimes law designed to imprison online activists. Not only that, and they imported the most sophisticated civilians to monitor online activism. And in this regard, I have to mention my colleague. Just one example, quick example, Ahmed Mansour. He's on the board of the GCHR. He's the first victim of Baker by where in 2015. It is not easy to be in a prison since the 20th of March, 2017, in solitary confinement until now, sentenced to 10 years for his tweets. He's a victim of surveillance technology. Himself, his family, his colleagues, all of us, we are still in pain. I think very little studies address the psychological, the psychological effect of using uh, civilians and other equipment to imprison and to monitor online uh, activists. Now, I have to also talk about another element, maybe it's not uh, uh, familiar, uh, not known to everybody, which is this unconditional support given by Western governments, in particular, I have to mention that, you and UK to our governments, oppressive governments. Uh, last uh, year, on the 15th of July, President Biden visited uh, Saudi Arabia. 
and he never mentioned the human rights, unfortunately. But we paid a heavy price. Our online activists, they were sentenced to 34 years in prison, 45 years in prison, and the same thing happened in, in other uh, parts of the MENA region. So we are paying a lot of heavy price for this unconditional support. You, you need to show visibility to defenders in MENA region. We are facing all kinds of, of risk, but we are getting very little from Western governments. In the very heart of the EU, uh, uh, that these guidelines to protect human rights defenders, but they never implement in, in our region. Now, I have to say, there is no any local remedy in our uh, countries to address human rights violations. We are only relying on international advocacy. Are we uh, going to sit here and just complain? No. We are going to pick up the space available to us and to promote human rights for, for our people. We are going to observe. We are going to document. We are going to report to the international community. I know it is a slow, but I believe strongly that the change is coming, the peaceful change is coming. It will take time. And for that, we did a lot of uh, uh, activities, we did a lot of advocacy, and we, we are getting success, partial success, but that is a good sign that we are moving in the right direction. I have to say that although justice is not uh, uh, something that uh, victims in our region are uh, dream of, perpetrators are still free uh, in the streets, but we started to use this international concept of international ju jurisdiction, and we uh, and others, we have many cases. The GCHR, we have five cases in, in France and in UK against perpetrators of tortures in our countries, and that is a good start. We believe strongly that we will win, but as I said, it will take time. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid, um, for sharing um, your experiences and the experiences of your partners. We will turn to you one more time in a little bit to discuss further um, your experience in engaging with the United Nations and uh, other multilateral organizations. Maji, let me turn to you. Next, uh, Carefunding Nigeria is a civil society organization that seeks to prevent and transform <coughs> violent extremism and address the consequences of terrorism on mental health through integrating trauma consciousness, resilience, and healing. You work with communities that are seriously affected by both terrorism and the harms created through efforts to prevent and counter it. How do you create trust and real, uh, real, realize positive progress mm -hmm. among varied stakeholders at the local and national level? What principal challenges do you face in doing so? <clears throat> yeah, uh, Your Excellencies, good morning, colleagues. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night to some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name is Maji, and it's, it's interesting to realize that before I even speak about violent extremism, we have to acknowledge the fact that it is right now mutating. The interventions around violent extremism that we used to have 10 years back is not the same. Right now, especially in the Sahel, we have a lot of terrorist actions without extremist ideation. So the interventions of thinking about working around strategic communication, counter-radicalization, de-radicalization, engagement around concepts of looking at push and pull factor that led to radicalization is no longer the in thing. Because there are plenty of people who now engage in terrorist actions for economic benefit. And unfortunately, we have allowed that to fetter for too long, so it has created in the Sahel what we call the war economy. And unless we're able to address the attraction of the war economy, our efforts, our interventions, our programming to prevent or transform violent extremism will be like we are winking in the dark. We know we're doing something, but nobody will see what we're doing. And working in the communities, uh, it has been very difficult, especially because many a times, as a sovereign nation, what governments always want to do is to have structural militarization. 
So the intervention that comes from government prior is always to counter. And in countering is sending out the structures of the security operatives to see what they can do. Because what government understand is the cessation of hostility. And when you come in to do intervention in those communities, because of abuses that goes with interventions around militarization, because of abuses of human rights that goes with intervention around preventing and countering violent extremism, the mistrust that exists between the structures of government and the community is transferred to organizations that come to do intervention. So you have to be able to win the trust of the community. You have to be able to ensure that the community believes in what you're doing. That means you have to start ab initio by engaging community, winning their trust, and carrying them along in your plan for intervention. And how do we do that? We always ensure that when we're having our engagement, we start with community consultation, going into communities, identifying stakeholders, uh, doing a context analysis, understanding the structures of that community, identifying community stakeholders and gatekeepers, and then looking at the needs and challenges of those communities. Thereafter, you try to identify, are there victims in those communities? Did they join because of radicalization or did they join due to coercion? Because in engaging with someone who is radicalized and someone who is coerced, we must identify that the intervention must be pulled apart. So if you're able to come into the community and they realize that you're not coming here because you're judging them, you're not coming here because you're thinking that they're part of the whole thing, and that's why the whole principle of moral equality comes to play. All of us can become victims, can become perpetrators of extremist acts depending on the situation that we're at. In accessing that, you have to look at what is my cycle of safety and what is my cycle of ideation. If I am threatened and there is nothing I can do and I'm being coerced, my chances of saying no is very limited. If I'm not being intimidated, I'm not being coerced, I'm not being threatened, and I joined a group, you know that I'm convinced and I'm radicalized to do it. So if you look at that, that gives you how to engage. But irrespective of what we think and the interventions that we think we're going to get into, unless you win the trust of the people in the community, unless you're able to have a program that imbibes social cohesion, unless you're able to bring a program that speaks to community resilience, you're not going to go anywhere. Because the truth is, violent extremism does not just affect the people. It does not just affect the community, it impacts it. And when we talk about impactation, that means it leaves a lasting experience that if not processed, it manifests in later life. That's why if you do a trauma assessment, in any community that is traumagenic, you realize that majority of the population are manifesting signs and symptoms of PTSD. And that is going to go on unless you integrate uh, trauma awareness, trauma consciousness, and mental uh, well-being into your interventions. Because the whole issue of re-traumatization comes back. The whole issue of uh, trigger because of the experiences of the adverse childhood experience that will have affected the children will come to play in their later life. So unless that happens, but what happens to victims? What happens to perpetrators? A lot of times when government comes with interventions to prevent or to resolve violent extremism, we focus on the perpetrators of the crime. We hardly talk about the victims, and that is what affects reintegration. Mm -hmm. If I'm a victim of violence, extremist crime, and government want to ensure that this thing is no longer happening, and they set up a system that only try to rehabilitate those who are perpetrators of the crime, and they come back to the same community, I could testify to the fact that they have killed members of my family. I could testify to the fact that they have burned down my home, they have burned down my business. Government is not thinking about me as the victim. The interventions are not looking at where I am at and what is happening to me. But they're looking at the, somebody who was perpetrator of that crime and they're trying to reintegrate him. 
they take them, they do the radicalization, they do psychosocial support, they do mental wellness tests, they give them life skills, and they integrate them back into community. How about me? Two things will happen. Either I go to join a violent extremist group and surrender so that I can have that benefit, or I'm going to take that person out. Vengeance, anger, and desire for revenge. So the whole concept of trust comes when people realize that in your engagement, you're not just looking at those who have caused them that hurt. You're looking at how the whole society approach of wellness comes to play. And that's when we start thinking about the concept of restorative justice. Victims, perpetrators, platform for engagement and identifying what you think works for you and what you think should be used to ensure that everything comes to bear. So basically, that's what we try to do. And it's not as easy as we're talking about it. Because it takes time to build this trust. It takes time to get this engagement. It takes time for you to win people's understanding and acceptance. It's always difficult when you walk around this space with people who are not entirely trauma aware, people who are looking using timelines and not indicators. I always tell people when you engage within the space of preventing violent extremism, use indicators and not timelines. You could be doing the same thing for six months and you think there is no difference. If you're using timeline, six months is a long time. If you're using indicators, have there been a shift from when we have started? Sometimes you realize there is a shift, even when the people are not saying anything. Their action is not what it used to be. So our interventions, our engagement must always be broad-based in such a way that it integrates all the needs, all the expectations of everybody who has been involved. We have inciters, we have perpetrators, we have victims. And in this engagement, everybody is in a different category and engaging with them must take a different approach. That's the whole thing that will make it work. And then there must be collaboration because there are people who are conflict entrepreneurs. There are others who benefit from the act of terrorism. So they will do anything to ensure there is a sustainability of that threats and actions because it becomes a means of livelihood. I mean, right now there are people who are service providers within the space of the war economy that banditry and terrorism has created. We must look at such people too in our interventions and we must get them on our side because we need to win their trust because they have narratives too that they market in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Maji. Um, we're going to turn to you as well one more time to talk a bit more about the international context and how that has affected the work um, that you're doing. Mavic, also thank you for joining us today. The Global Alliance for Women Peacebuilders is a network of over 100 women's organizations from countries that are experiencing humanitarian crisis or conflict. Can you reflect on the necessity for civil society to organize <laughs> themselves to work with governments and the United Nations to strengthen a global movement for women's rights, gender equality, and sustainable peace? Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, it's Global Network of Women Peace Builders, uh, not Alliance. Um, the fact that we have a Women, Peace, and Security agenda, which is backed by 10 Security Council resolutions, is a testament to what civil society, particularly Women Peace Builders, have achieved in collaborating with governments and the UN. Uh, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, particularly Resolution 1325, which was first adopted among the uh, 10 resolutions in uh, 2000, was advocated for and co-drafted by peace activists around the world, particularly women peace builders. So that already demonstrates the co-ownership with the UN and with member states, and such as uh, Bangladesh, Canada, Namibia, and at the time, UNIFEM and other UN entities. And um, it is also important to know that the Women, Peace, and Security agenda enabled a paradigm shift uh, by which the UN Security Council 
and the rest of the international community respond to international conflicts or, uh, or conflicts that take place around the world. It has put women's leadership and decision making on matters of peace and security at all levels at the center of response to the conflict. Before, women were never part of the Security Council discussions and decision making. And the usual uh, response, which is up to now I, I refer to as uh, mandate fixation, was that Security Council is in charge of peace and security, gender and women's rights are with ECOSOC, so this is not a place for women. And of course, the traditional belief that peace and security is a male domain, and women do not have expertise on them. And, and Resolution 1325 shifted the paradigm, changed that thinking, and um, changed the perception that the women are only victims and mostly passive victims of conflict instead of peace builders, leaders, and decision makers. And it is also important to underscore that human rights principles, international human rights standards, are intentionally integrated in the women, peace, and security agenda, beginning with women's rights to make decisions and to take on leadership roles, and uh, supported by uh, their right to protection from sexual and gender-based violence. And here I would like to make a very clear, dif um, very clear uh, differentiation between the right to protection and the, the, uh, the recognition, protection, and fulfillment of their rights. So while we say it's important to protect women from sexual and gender-based violence, it is equally, if not more important, to recognize, protect, promote and fulfill their rights. Because if those rights are recognized, they can protect themselves. Women don't have to be depending on anyone for their own protection. They have the agency, they have the capacity. Um, it, I also would like to uh, emphasize that in addition to the nine uh, follow-up resolutions to 1325, there are twin resolutions on sustaining peace agenda uh, that um, the women, peace, and security agenda is being implemented in complementation with, along with the youth, peace, and security agenda. And um, so all of this point out to the importance of collaboration between civil society and governments and the UN. Collab meaningful collaboration, not tokenization of civil society. That's very important to note. Thank you, Mavic. Um, great examples, I think, on where also that collaboration should start with the, with the resolutions. We will turn to you one more time as well um, to, to hear a bit more what can we learn from the examples of the Global Network for Women Peace Builders and the NGO Working Group for Women, Peace and Security. I have the ungrateful job of reminding everyone on the time, so I apologize. Um, um, and I know we could, we could talk for a really long time and I hope we will continue to talk about this important issue after today. Um, but if I could remind our panelists of uh, a few minutes and then we will hopefully have time to turn to as many interventions um, as possible. Um, Machi, I come, I come back to you. Um, your work, and as you described and shared with all of us, is extremely local and contextualized, although you have also found ways to share your approaches and experiences with other civil society actors across the African continent. How is your work affected by the international context, including by the actions of the United Nations and the African Union? And what form of multilateral engagement can organizations like yours most benefit from? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm an ardent believer in uh, collaboration and not competition. Obviously, we can't do it alone. And uh, in my local palace, 
They say when you have many guests at the wedding, the party is more fun. So I think it's always good when we have a platform where we could all engage and collaborate. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of work, like the last activity we did with the Global Center. We were basically working in Nigeria, in the northeast of Nigeria, and in the coastal provinces of Kenya, where Al-Shabaab is very active. And what we tried to do there is to share best practices, to share learning, to engage with civil society organizations, especially in capacity building and knowledge transfer. So that this is what we have done. This is how we have engaged. We try to do all of that. Coming to multilateral organizations like the AU and the UN, uh, they've been able to develop documents that we could use. They've been able to create, create platform that we could engage. But there is a need for contextualization and localization of interventions and implementations of activities. In the early days that we started working in the Northeast, <clears throat> The greatest issue we had in the Northeast then was that of capacity. A lot of the capacities that is needed is not in the Northeast. So you have to start bringing people from outside of the Northeast to engage, and when they are no longer there, those competence, those capabilities are no longer on the ground. But when we started working with civil society organizations that are based in the Northeast, when we started working with community-based organizations that are localized, when we started giving them capacity to support their communities in building resilience, in developing psychosocial first aid, in developing a referral pathway, then the job is more sustained. So the greatest issue we are having with multilateral organizations is when they think about interventions, it's high time they start thinking about continuity and sustainability. The most viable intervention is the one that outlived the grant circle. But when the engagement ends, when the grant ceased, then we have virtually done nothing. So it's always good for us to be able to work with locals, contextualize it, so that people will be able to understand that we must set up a platform for sustainability and continuity. The project that we're doing now, securing Nigerian communities, we try to set up structures in states, and then we train people as psychosocial first aiders, we develop referral pathways, and in doing that, <clears throat> what we do is to have what they call a listening center, that could provide psychosocial services in the community, in community-free spaces, so that at the end of the grand circle, they're not looking for money to pay for rents. We support them with furnitures. So the community provides spaces where they could use, and it is very sustained. That's a very fantastic approach that Equal Access have brought into the game. And then in developing early warning, early response mechanism, they created a system of civilian security platform, community accountability forum that are localized. So what I'm trying to say is any intervention that we're going to engage with within multilateral intergovernmental agencies, there must be a focus on sustainability and continuity. And in doing that, it means the push of the intervention must be localized. Civil society organizations, community-based organizations that have a presence and a passion for what they're doing so that even when the program cycle is ended, the activities will go on. Thank you, Maji. Khalid, as a follow-up to the previous question, can you share some of the risks civil society, including human rights defenders, face, especially when engaging on counterterrorism and broader security and human rights issues when working with the United Nations and other multilateral organizations? What preconditions must be fulfilled for civil society to strengthen its engagement with the United Nations? Uh, thank you, Francisca. Uh, the reality governments in the MENA region and other regions are using reprisals as a tool to imprison uh, the vendors who are engaging with the international mechanism, including the UN system. We have many examples. Uh, Abdel Hadi Khawaja in Bahrain serving life. He, he won the Martin Allah's Award last year. He's still in prison. Paid a happy price himself, his family, his colleagues. And uh, there are other examples. Dr. Mohammed Qahtan in Saudi Arabia. One of the charges against him, working clearly, publicly, written in the fair tech, working with the United uh, Nations. So it is very difficult. I know there is a, a, a report every year uh, by the General Secretary of UN, and I know for sure that uh, uh, 
uh, without uh, accurate research, there is no any successful advocacy. But then we have to be proactive instead of being reactive. Those people who are engaging with the UN uh, system, they are going to get uh, arrested. Uh, that is for sure. I could speak for my region, and I think other regions, they have the same uh, chronic problem. Uh, and I think it's time for, for, for the UN and other mechanisms, governments who are supporting human rights, to do something serious about it. I have to tell you that at the moment, you know, it is days that we are preparing for our activities uh, within the 53rd session of the Human Rights Council. No, even one single defender from many countries across uh, the MENA region. No one from Syria, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from all the Gulf countries, from Algeria. Why? It is reprisals. Okay, we are going to document it and we are going to show it in reports, but what else we could do? The other problem is visas. Do you know for us to bring somebody from Iraq or from Yemen or from Syria, it will take half a year to get a Swiss visa. As to the US, it will take two years. So how we are going to participate in the activities of the UN? It is very easy to, you know, put it in words. But we need a practical actions to make it uh, uh, accessible for, for, for our community of defenders to uh, participate in the activities of the UN. There are other issues, but uh, I, I think I stop here. Uh, we need to hear from the audience. <laughs> Thank you, Khalid. What a, what a note to end on. Um, <clears throat> final question is for you, Mavic. Networks, alliances, coalition, and coordination mechanisms have made a tremendous difference for gender equality and the women, peace, and security agenda, as you, as you mentioned earlier. The Global Network for Women Peace Builders and the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security are two very important examples in this regard. What can we learn from the successes of these models for more effective civil society engagement on counterterrorism issues, especially with an eye towards promoting human rights and gender equality? Thank you, Francisca. Uh, the <clears throat> organizational model of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders is very different from that of the NGO Working Group, although we're also a member of the NGO Working Group. So I'll be speaking uh, uh, from our GNWP experience. So <clears throat> we are a coalition of 100, more than 100 organizations in over 50 countries, many of which are based in local communities directly affected by violent conflicts and crisis. And that is why our flagship program <clears throat> is the localization of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and Gender Responsive Humanitarian Action in synergy with the Youth, Peace, and Security and Sustaining Peace Resolutions. And I, I was so appreciative hearing Maji uh, emphasizing the uh, localization as a, strat as a key strategy. So some of the lessons learned that we can um, harvest from this experience is number one, the importance of bringing local perspectives from the margin to the center. They're often and often or almost always on the periphery. Many are singing praises to the importance of reaching out to local communities, participation of local populations, but very few are really doing it. Um, and um, so why is this important? It is vital because violent conflict is one of the strongest predictors of the impact of terrorism. Uh, therefore, we need to question what are the root causes of conflict and what are the local perspectives on this because the success or failure of our international peace building and sustaining peace and counterterrorism efforts will always come down to the local level to the local communities. How are we making positive and transformative difference in the lives of local populations, particularly the marginalized and vulnerable, including women, uh, LGBTQIA person, uh, persons with disabilities, and so on and so forth. So the operative word here is meaningful, or operative phrase is meaningful inclusion. And the opposite of that is exclusion, which equates to violence. 
Um, the, which brings me to my uh, next uh, lesson learned. And um, Maji also um, referred to this is the importance of conducting and starting from a context analysis. Uh, or to be more exact in this situation, conflict or terrorism and gender analysis, where we do this on a regular basis. This is our starting point. We gather all local leaders, like mayors, vice mayors, councillors, indigenous leaders, uh, community elders, faith leaders, school teachers, and local police and military, and of course, at the center of all of this are women's grassroots women's organizations and youth organizations to ref uh, respond or ask themselves and reflect to questions like, what are the root causes of conflict? Who are the warring parties? How are families and communities affected? What is the impact on women and girls? And um, the participants in this uh, conflict analysis will always identify human rights abuses as one of the root causes of conflict and threats of uh, terrorism. Uh, they will probably speak about sexual and gender-based violence, economic inequalities, rule of law breakdown, but all of these are related to human rights. Uh, another lesson learned is the knowledge of local communities in setting up protection network and mechanisms. And with all due respect to our colleagues in big international NGOs and the UN, we've experienced this ourselves in Colombia, in South Sudan, in Afghanistan, in, in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. Whenever there's a human rights defender or women peace builders uh, who are being threatened, or in, in, in one case, uh, a partner of us, in, in the refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar was raped, it is so hard or so slow to mobilize response and, and direct help from big international NGOs and uh, UN entities because for to release, let's say $300 to help the victim and her family to relocate, at least five people have to sign the disbursement form. Whereas local organizations that we work with can just go there and give help, uh, you know, it, it, in, in very little time. So that's the third setting up of protection network for women peace builders and human rights defenders. The fourth is um, the development uh, of counterterrorism counterterrorism policies with meaningful participation of civil society. And earlier, <clears throat> the permanent representative of Denmark uh, uh, referred to a whole of society approach or a whole of nation approach, meaning policies should not only be developed by government. We know we don't have a shortage of policies anywhere in the world. Well, no shortage of policies. What is, the sh what is the shortage? It's in the implementation because people are not involved in policy making and policy implementation. How can you participate in something that you don't know? You know, something that is just, you know, announced in the newspaper or you see on social media. You don't know. You don't. You don't own it. You don't. You're not invested in it. So those are some of the lessons learned that I think we can. Uh, yeah, um, we, we, we can build on in our work in promoting uh, the centrality of a human rights-based approach to our work in counterterrorism. Thank you so much, Mavic, um, for those insights. We will revert one more time for final reflections to all three of our panelists, but I will turn now to our pre-registered interventions. I recognize there might be be a few individuals in the room who haven't registered, but also want to say a few words. Um, I don't know if we will get to any of them, but please indicate if, if there is an interest. Um, for now, I would love to turn to Asha Leke, uh, Christian Leke, African Union Youth Ambassador for Peace and Executive Director of Local Youth Corner Cameroon. Thank you for being here, Asha Leke. Thank you so much. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to be uh, in the room, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, so I, I have two reflections actually, and um, I'm very happy to 
uh, yeah, the reflection around the intersection between uh, women, peace and security and youth peace and security. Uh, but I, I think my first reflection goes to Majid. Um, he raised something which is very important, the focus on perpetrators as well. And, and he was advocating for the need for um, victims to also be focused on, uh, which, are so, which I think is something which is, you know, it's, it's, it's in the process. But I think the bigger bane um, is what about those who want to solve the problems? Do we invest in them as much as possible? Because we always want to think that it's about the perpetrator and the victim. We don't think about the ones who are forming social movements, civil society movements, and wanting to do this work. They are as critical as those who are suffering. Because the decision not to pick up arms is something which we do not celebrate. We talk all the time, why do young people join? I've worked on the field for 15 years. I know what it means to be violent. It's sweeter to be peaceful. We need to make peace be good business. And that's the fact about it. We are talking about the war economy. What about the peace building economy? So we are focusing a lot on victims, perpetrators, and all of that. For 15 years of my life, I grew up, I know what violence looks like. I didn't read in any book. But it's sweeter today, and I can see many young people today creating movements because they see Christian. Because working for peace gives hope to the community. Because hope is the main thing that's missing. So I wanted to reflect, let, let's think about the importance of celebrating, supporting civil society. People want to create movements to solve these problems. Because we are complementing government, we are complementing all the big UN Security Council resolutions because we are on the field. And, and secondly, my reflection is around protection. Because as a person working on the ground, I know what it means to be threatened. I know what it means uh, to see text message. I know what it means to be called. It's different when you work in fancy offices. You don't know how it feels like. Several young people call me Christian. I, I, I'm done. I'm not going to do this work any longer because I've been called. You know, I'm afraid my family, my mother. I'm from the English-speaking regions of my country. I've been working in the space before that. The reflection around protection of young people, do we reflect around this? Like she mentioned, bigger civil societies have bigger budgets. They have insurance for staff. A study we did in Cameroon showed that over 60% of youth-led civil society working for peace operate under 3,000 US dollars for budget. Now, this 3,000 US dollars is to do activities. They don't think about insurance. We don't think about their safe passage. We don't think about the 300 dollars you're talking about for movement. Many civil society do not even know it exists. But they are risking their lives. They are putting everything on the line. I think we need to start reflecting on in every project that we do, we mobilize resources to train these young people in civil society on how to protect themselves. Because just like the ones who carried arms who are feeling like Commando, Rambo, is the same thing the young people want to work for peace. They are thinking there will be Nelson Mandela. But they didn't understand for Nelson Mandela to be who he is, there are core values, there are core practices that you must uphold to ensure that you stay protected, to ensure that what you say builds and doesn't do harm. Do we invest on this? I don't see this happening for 15 years of my, my time in this space. And also, keeping resources for the safe passage of the civil society that we engage. Many big organizations, year present, when you go to the countries, you work with civil society organization. Today in the African continent, we have more youth-led young boys and girls, women, CSO organization than adults. Quote me anywhere. But do we reflect on putting resources in the projects, quotas. We need to start thinking about quotas. As a civil society organization, in every project I do, I ensure that it is part of it. How many young people go for training for INSO Alert? Do we promote this? Do we engage them on this? We are kidnapped, we are killed, we are maimed, we are arrested every day. Should we leave the space? If we leave the space, we get radicalized, we get killed, it's the same thing. While we are committing with all these resolutions, my call is we must think about protection intentionally and know these young people that sometimes we meet in the nice meetings, that could be the last time you see them or you meet them because they are working for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashaliki. Um, I might ask you if you want to directly address it in your final reflections, and we take a few more interventions if there's anything you want to respond. I would go next to Alyssa Yamamoto on behalf of the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while Countering Terrorism. 
Thank you, Francie. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, it's a real pleasure to address you on behalf of the Special Rapporteur. And thank you to the Global Center, to OHCHR, and to the governments of Costa Rica, Denmark, and the Netherlands for hosting this really important and timely event. The Special Rapporteur, as many of you know, has long emphasized the importance of meaningful civil society participation in the UN counterterrorism architecture and, of course, in counterterrorism and PCVE practice more broadly. It's with this in mind that we launched the global study on the impact of counterterrorism measures on civil society and civic space, which we will issue tomorrow on the margins of this conference. Without preempting the study, I did just want to take a moment to underscore three preconditions of meaningful civil society participation, actually using our global study respondents' own words. So first, meaningful civil society participation starts from, quote, the government acknowledging the fundamentally discriminatory approach to counterterrorism that has existed to date, end quote. It requires diversity in voices and emphasis on the inclusion of vulnerable groups. And that includes ethnic and racial minorities, LGBT and gender diverse persons, youth, human rights defenders, humanitarians, peace builders, and the many other groups that we've discussed today. Second, meaningful civil society participation means, quote, that anyone can participate on their own terms and that those who provide evidence are not smeared or targeted as a result, end quote. It requires a commitment to safety, protection against reprisals, and most importantly, adequate remedy and rep reparation if a, a reprisal occurs. Third, meaningful civil society participation requires, quote, subjective elements such as agency, responsibilities, decision making, agenda and standard setting, narrative framing, access to power and institutions, attitudes and beliefs, end quote. It requires true incorporation of local terms and priorities, not top down hegemonic approaches to terrorism and security challenges. As others today have really emphasized, I think we can all agree that superficial reform and box ticking will not solve the crisis of misuse and the dearth of uh, civil society engagement today. Collective corrective action is urgently needed at the highest levels here at the UN and must respond to what civil society themselves define as meaningful participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I would next go to Laura Jamberlin from Global Affairs Canada. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Franzi. This has been an absolutely incredible, insightful panel for me. Uh, and first, I just want to extend my thanks to the Global Center for organizing this important event. Your small but mighty team is an absolutely invaluable role in holding the UN and member states accountable for our counterterrorism agendas. And your advocacy pushes us to be more innovative and more grounded in our efforts. In Canada, we follow the principle that diversity is our strength. We have committed partnerships with civil society in our peace and security efforts. And we believe in the importance of bringing their perspectives forward so we can build community resilience that is inclusive, gender reformed, and, and operates through an intersectional lens. And our co-facilitation of this year's GCTS uh, review with Tunisia, we are pleased that we could continue to formalize CSO engagement through consultation throughout the process. The various iterations of the Blue Sky Report in particular presents an important window into the challenges, opportunities, and concerns experienced by CSOs in their UN engagement in CT and PCVE, but it also presents a vital mirror with which we can examine how we as member states are helping, helping or hindering the building of sustainable peace. It has been demonstrated time and time again that specific, context-specific, locally-owned initiatives drive sustainable and effective counterterrorism and preventing and countering violent extremism efforts. Despite the incremental progress made over the past few years, there remains a mismatch between, on the one hand, our verbal acknowledgement of the importance of CSOs in shaping policies and programs, and, on the other, the growing difficulties that CSOs continue to experience through the shrinking of civic space. Critically, our efforts need to go beyond the mere references throughout the occasional uh, resolution sprinkled here and there. We need, to be meaningfully, we need to be meaningful and intentional about incorporating the lived experiences of those most affected by violence and terrorism. We continue to learn what works and what doesn't in our approaches, but one consistent factor is whether or not 
the communities that are most impacted by terrorism and violent extremism have a vested interest in the interventions and solutions that we propose. We need to be bolder and braver in our work, both at the UN and the member state level. We as member states need to take to heart the lessons from civil society and build partnerships for peace that are based on listening to their perspectives and also more importantly, acting on those lessons. CSOs have creative solutions and we need their perspectives to strategically inform our strategies and we need to challenge ourselves to move beyond the consultation work with civil society in innovative ways to leverage their local knowledge, community trust and engagement. The Global Center is a key partner for Canada and we value your tireless efforts to keep us and hold us accountable. Thank you so much for all the CSOs have all, who have also shared their work and expressed their concerns. You're heard, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for those kind words, and we will take you up and uh, holding you and others accountable. Um, I might take one more intervention. I don't know if she's here. I have Anna Larson from the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict on my list. There you are. Thank you for being here, Anna. Thank you. And thank you to the moderator and to the organizers of this important discussion. Um, as the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, we would like to reiterate that global and national policies, which ultimately should have an impact on the lives of people at the community level, must be informed by their own experiences and implemented in meaningful partnership with them. We see at GPAC that meaningful partnerships are built on the following pillars. Firstly, the engagement of local actors from the design of the strategy to the formulation of interventions to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Including civil society leads to greater impact of the work at the community level. We do not see enough of such inclusive structures in CT, CVE. This engagement should be, sorry, should be systematic and institutionalized with dedicated resources and concrete commitments. Secondly, meaningful partnerships are built on safe spaces through risk-informed engagement. We will not touch on the issue of reprisals. However, we noticed a clear stigma associated with working on CT at the country level. When governments design their policies and laws, it is important to remember that civil society that addresses terrorism-related issues are partners. They are not enemies. Governments should not discourage their work, and they should support it. Thirdly, engagement with the feedback loop. Many of us are invited to speak during dialogues this week. How many of us will know if we have been heard and what results from these meetings? The feedback loop is extremely important to facilitate partnerships rather than one-off dialogues. And finally, engagement through networks and coalitions provides an opportunity to facilitate a comprehensive and inclusive input in decision making. It is clear that participation is a hard practice as someone always feels excluded. Instead of bringing together various partners who individually may feel excluded, it may be worth considering consolidation perspectives to enable more diverse views to come through in different networks of partners. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I unfortunately will have to, to cap it here. Again, a reminder, if you would like to share your reflections and intervention um, with us, please do so via email. I will now turn back to our panelists for a final one minute response on reflections. And I uh, will turn to Khalid first, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Francisca. Just uh, briefly, um, I believe strongly that uh, the peaceful changes uh, coming in our countries with our collective actions and togetherness. And also I add to that a special thank to all the organizers, in particular the Global Center on Cooperative uh, Security. Thank you all also for making time for your support. I hope that uh, the near future will uh, will give us some good news about uh, the human rights uh, situation in our region and other regions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khalid. Maji, I would come to you next for final reflections. Yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I think it has been a robust conversation this morning. It's always nice to be in this kind of a space. And to my kid brother, always nice to see you. <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's good that we're thinking about those who are couriers of the process. That's talking about civil society organization. But the whole idea is 
our intervention as organizations too should focus on sustainability and continuity. As much as we are agitating that peace should be a human right thing, everybody has a right to peace. Uh, we should also realize that when we talk about focusing on victims and perpetrators, even those of us who are organizations are guilty of the same thing. Mostly in our programmatics, we don't look at what we call the inclusive approach to doing it. I think it's good for us to do that. And like I will always say, if we need to measure up, we need to realize that the field of violent extremism is mutating. We must understand the speed, the space, and the, fle and the texture of the mutation, and our program should be flexible enough to meet those needs. And we should always look at not just the push and pull factors. We should look at the structures that made the push and pull factors appealing. Thank you. Thank you, Maji. Um, last but definitely not least, Mavic, any reflections you would like to share? Yes, I would like to um, underscore, oh, thank you. I would like to underscore the important roles uh, of civil society in ensuring that our counterterrorism efforts are focused on human rights and based on the rule of law. One, uh, there are many, but I'll just uh, mention three. One, CSOs, civil society, have access to information about terrorism threats in local communities so they can play a role in early warning. Second, they are trusted in local communities, as already mentioned by uh, some of our colleagues, and they uh, influence local and national authorities and cultural leaders so they can serve as the bridge that raises awareness and disseminate information and knowledge about counterterrorism measures and the centrality of human rights uh, in them. And third, CSOs are knowledgeable Often, again, with all due respect to, to some of our, to our government uh, colleagues, are, are often more knowledgeable about human rights laws. In developing counterterrorism measures or policies, they will undoubtedly assert compliance with international human rights standards women's right, on, women's right, on human rights, women's rights, peace, and security. And then, uh, in a world <clears throat> that is saddled with uh, violent conflicts and crisis and where democracy is under assault, women's rights activists and civil society actors must continue coming together to consolidate our movements and recommit to our shared human rights principles and feminist values to ensure that counterterrorism measures comply with and fully respect international human rights standards. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mavic. Thank you to all of our panelists and audience uh, for all of you being here and our partners um, around the world. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Mina Noor, Special Envoy for Counterterrorism of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thank you for being here, Mina. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, I think I have the honor, but I'm also feeling very humbled to address you here in the final comments um, because I'm absolutely amazed by the richness of the, the contributions of the, the colleagues around the table. I think that is already a, a great added value to this week, uh, bringing these voices in this room around the table, not only to the UN but also to uh, the, the member states uh, to us, the policymakers in these uh, uh, member states, the donors, those who are engaged in these countries. Um, it reminds us about the importance of involving civil society organizations. Now, that has been said so often around the table. Today, yesterday, and it will probably be said throughout the whole week. I think the fact that these experiences are shared here is already a reason that helps us to understand the, the importance of genuine interest in what is happening on the ground. Local, uh, uh, how do local actors react, uh, perceive the developments, and ensuring that those voices are reaching us. It also requires, I think, from policymakers to step away from the blueprints that, are we, that we are used to, because uh, it's very easy for us to stick to our project uh, uh, life cycles, for example. And I think it was a very good comment, uh, which was made by saying, stick to uh, 
indicators, not to timelines. But it means in practice for us that we are faced with this challenge of how to do that because we have financial years. And so the practicalities of such things, it triggers me to think about uh, uh, these matters. Um, um, I think it's also uh, um, important uh, to realize that the aspect of focusing only on uh, perpetrators and not on victims, that is also something that uh, we also within the international community don't do that much anymore because we kind of feel like the victims are being taken care of by the local communities, but we forget that those communities actually do need our help. We realize perpetrators need to go back, but we don't realize that that doesn't lead to sustainable societies. If you want to create sustainable societies, you have to work on reconciliation. Reconciliation means really investing in the, in the communities and means also having, again, the time to do that, having uh, uh, not dealing with, with, with the deadlines that we are working with, having the time and having a genuine interest in, uh, in uh, making a difference. So I think there's a lot of work to be done for us, at least at policy, as policymakers. And again, I want to congratulate you for uh, bringing this panel together, bring is, bringing this, uh, uh, these insights around the table, uh, and also ensuring that we, all of us, become aware of how important it is to having this conversation with all of you. Thank you.